A very interesting passage from James chapter 4, verse 4. Just one verse. You adulterous people, some of you might have you adulterers and adulteresses. That is not there in the Greek uh, manuscript. It literally says adulterous people. And that always refers to, in most of the cases, to spiritual adultery. In the Old Testament, the, uh, the Lord God says, Israel, you are my bride, and you have deserted me for other idols and gods. In the New Testament, we as the church are to be the bride of Christ at that great marriage uh, supper in the Lamb, uh, with the Lamb, our groom. And uh, we are sometimes, you know, accused and warned against spiritual adultery. And so this is primarily what uh, James is talking about. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? And anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. How many of you in here, I'll vote first, how many of you in here have ever been set up by somebody else, they've looked at you straight in the face, lied through their teeth, you bought it hook, line, and sinker, and then later on, boy, they walked off laughing. Anyone here? Let's see the hands. Come on. There you go. All right. Well, you identify with what we're talking about. Well, here's the news today. Satan is seeking to establish his own sting operation in every one of our lives and to make us enemies of the gospel of Christ rather than the friends of our Lord. And the tragedy is that if the Lord would come today and look around at every one of us, he would reveal to some of us something we don't have the slightest suspicion of, that your living is my enemy. Jim, Sue, Ann, Bob, Jack. Here's an area of your life that Satan has set you up. He is cheating you. He is robbing you. You're living as an enemy of the Son of God who you say you love. I want all of us, especially those of us who are men, to really examine that thought and come before him today in honesty. Father, Father, in honesty, where am I being cheated? Where am I believing the lie of the enemy? Where am I buying in to the false philosophy of the world and hurting you? Now, some of us, even though we may not think we are, better ask God where we are because all of us have this happen to us. Let's look at the text. Adultery. Now, the sin of adultery is nothing more than infidelity to love. We break God's heart. Adultery really pri primarily, I believe, means obedience, uh, means a dilution of our obedience to God. It, it robs us of the maximum taste of life. God is not, well, he is. I don't want to put down this idea of adultery. It's a tragic mistake and a terrible wound and a real subtle trap of Satan. But the problem may be even greater than the act. The problem is the dilution of life. Because someone who lives an adulterous life, spiritually toward God, is diluting and weakening and marginalizing and limiting and creating all kinds of unhappiness in the life. I love uh, Dr. Peppers, and especially when they put good syrup in it. I've gone, gotten these drinks before, and there's so much uh, carbonated water, you can't even taste the drink. And so whenever I spot me a place that has a lot of syrup, that's where I go. And I love that Dr. Pepper. And I had one not long ago, and I got carried away and came back. And by the time I got back, most of the ice had melted. And I couldn't wait to get my Dr. Pepper, you know, good. And I tasted like just colored water. It ruined it. You know, it was still there, but the ingredients had been diluted by the presence of a foreign object. We need quick obedience. The more we disobey God, the more our lives are diluted with that which is tasteless and empty. I came up with a motto a couple of years ago that I repeat to you now, and every one of us as men ought to thank it. Father, give me instant obedience, radical purity, everlasting endurance. That ought to be our hearts. Father, give me instant obedience, radical purity, everlasting endurance. Now, this is what this is all about. In fact, uh, one of the ways that uh, a man or a woman or a Christian can be sure that they are not living an adulterous life is a threefold little guard. Now, you gentlemen here today, you ladies, if you want to build a strong marriage, if you want to guard your marriage, as some authors say, if you want to affair proof your marriage, there are three absolutes that are essential. Gentlemen, here they are. Number one, 
They say if a person is to have the kind of marriage that God wants, number one, the man ought to be taking in great in doses of the Word of God, Scripture, and the Word of God constantly filtering our minds. Number two, we must be men of prayer, must be constantly looking to the Lord in honesty. And number three, there must be intimacy with our mates. <clears throat> now, intimacy is not an easy thing to come by. Not only do we need to have intimacy with our mates to create a great relationship, we need to have intimacy with God. And the two key factors of intimacy, as believe, is number one, honesty. Gordon MacDonald, who failed tragically, a great Christian leader, has written in his book that uh, all failure begins with secrets in relationships. There should be no secrets in a marriage. There should be no secrets with God. Oh, God knows, but we still try to cover it up. And so if we're to have great relationships, great marriages, there must be honesty. Number two, there must be the act of the will to please the other partner. I've told you a few weeks ago that I've come up with a new line about marriage. I'm having my first marriage sermon where I can dump all this on the poor groom. Bless his heart. You pray about this Saturday. Uh, but it dawned on me that when two couple, when a, when a couple stands here and they, veg, they pledge themselves to one another, the man should say, and I'm going to insert this in the wedding vow, I pledge on my sacred honor as long as I live with all the strength I have that I will make any change necessary in my life, any change, to prove I will love you like Christ loved me. How about that? Now, I don't know whether I'll say that to the girl or not, but at least I'll get as far as the man before maybe he walks out <laughs> and decides that he's not going to go on with this. But that's the key to intimacy. I will will anything necessary to love you like Christ loved me. Gentlemen, if we do that, and that's what we ought to vow again today, I hope that's one of the vows you'll write down, we will have that intimacy that guards our relationship with our wives. Secondly, do you not know, James says, the word is audate, two Greek words for know, gnosko, which means an experiential knowledge, audate, which is a conceptual knowledge. And God is telling us here through James that you know what you ought to do. You don't need to be taught this. It's been put in you by the Holy Spirit and by your natural creation, even as I've given it to you. You know that to be an enemy with the, I mean, a friend with the world will create an anim animosity in your life toward God. I remember a scripture I memorized uh, as a young Christian, still a good one. I'll share it with you. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18. The Lord says, come out from among them. Be separate, saith the Lord our God. Touch not the unclean thing. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Isn't that a great verse? When I was a young Christian, even way back in the 50s, we talked a lot about the separated Christian life. There were things that Christians did not do, and we, you know, were laughed at sometime for doing it, and they were rather simple in those days compared to the complexity of these days. Man, we didn't have TV when I became a believer. If you can, well, we did. It was just out. had 82 knob, knobs on it, black and white. The screen was about that big. That was not a big temptation. And some of the movies we would not go to would be Sunday school by measuring today. But there ought to be a separated Christian life. You and I should be separated from the things of the world, like, like it says in 2 Corinthians 6. Touch not the unclean thing. That means don't touch it with your eyes. Don't touch it with your heart. Don't touch it with your desire. Don't touch it with your ear. Don't touch it. You and I should have a separated life from that which is evil and have a passion to pursue only that which is good and which is righteous. I have talked to the Lord in my prayer time, and over the years, some have said, well, you know, UBC might be a liberal, might be, uh, you know, not really on the cutting edge of the gospel because we're so positive, and we are. And I believe basically we're a church that says people are, more people are going to be helped by telling them not what's wrong with them, but what's right with God. You go to some churches and all they talk about how bad we are, how bad the world is, how bad the nation is, how bad the government is, bad, bad, bad. Well, it may be all true, but it won't help anyone. The way we're going to be helped is seeing the glory of Jesus Christ. But there's another side of that, that we can be negative about your negativeness, about positive things. And that's where most of our preaching, I hope, is aimed at. Please, please don't be negative about the positive things of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I felt through the years that I was preaching to a group of people who were committed to Christ. Therefore, I could talk about the depth and the wonder of the Christian life. 
But the older I grow and the more I see things and the more the world comes into the church and the more you and I are victims, we succumb to Satan's sting, the more we're a part of what is anti-God and pro-God, the more I see this congregation in my own life. Hey, H, you better wake up and commit yourself in a new commitment, in a new radicalism for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe what the choir said, God needs a few good men. The question is today, will you and I be a part of that group? There are only two classes of people on earth as I see it, those looking for God and those just looking around. Which are you? We're either looking for God, oh, give me more of the Master, or we're just looking around. Isn't it amazing? Haven't you been stunned by the fact that we always seem to have enough of God but never have enough of the world? We need a, another car. We need another house. We need another suit. We need another office, we need another desk, we need another dress, we need another this, we need another trip, we need some more money, we need a, another bank account, we need... But we always seem to have enough of God. When it comes to God, well, we, we really have enough. We don't need to read the Word more, we don't need to pray more, we don't need to be with other Christians more, we don't need to assume more responsibility for His church. And I rebuke you today, I rebuke myself in the name of our Lord. What are you after in your life? This word here, friendship, literally means uh, a phileo is the Greek word, the same one the Lord used when he talked to Peter. Peter, do you phileo me? Do you love me? And I have to ask the question, what's the difference between a man of the world and a man of God? It's hard to see. It's hard to see, isn't it? Now, what am I asking for? Gentlemen, there must be some kind of radical reorientation of your commitment and my commitment, time with our wives, time with our children, and yes, time with our church. Some of us even use church as just an opportunity to be busy, to not do those things that God has really called us to do. This is not a time for less church. This is a time for more commitment to the body of Christ. That's what I'm appealing for. Please don't say this appeal is just for a few more numbers to count and send in somewhere. We don't send numbers in anywhere in our church. We just let God look down on us. And gentlemen, I'm appealing to you. Man, we need you. There needs to be a more radical commitment of your time. I don't know what. I'm not going to set up here and make a list. But our deacons need to be deacons, men who are servants of the church. Some of you men who've signed up with me in the 70, man, you need to take that covenant we've made. I will do this if nothing else. Some of you need to show up and be ushers and be working in the parking lot and take a Sunday school class and pray and watch your giving and your time and your money. Every time that offering, the offering plate's going to pass in just a few minutes. And you'll say, oh, I gave, you know, in Sunday school or I gave last week. Every time that plate passes, everyone in here ought to put something in it. This is now, not last week or in Sunday school. Like a little kid running up and say, Daddy, can I have a, an ice cream cone? I'll kid you had one last week. This now is the problem. And that's why giving of our money is an act of worship and adoration toward Jesus Christ. And that isn't a plea for another dollar or two. But when that plate is passed, that's your opportunity. Part of my worship for God. I've already given my tithe. Here's an expression of my offering. I haven't given my tithe. Lord, here's 10% of what I have. Or, Lord, here I am in my financial steward. I'm giving something to you. We need some kind of radical reorientation about what we're doing as men to lead our church to break this kind of gap that says 40% less time is being spent in the home today than it was a generation ago. Look at our kids and we know something's wrong. Now, what we can do, what are we going to do? Curse the darkness? Remember that old deal? Rather than curse the darkness, just what? Light one candle. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he appeared, said that they who walk in darkness have seen a great light. We've seen the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to make a fast decision. I love this joke. That, uh, of Calvin and Hobbes. How many of you all read the funnies? I don't anymore. Notice I didn't even look out. Uh, that's all right. Maybe I need to. I need to laugh a little more. I've prayed about that. Lord, let me have a little more ha-ha in my life. Uh, but I like this. I don't want to be just a serious ogre, an old man, you know, trying to go to death. I promised my wife I'm going to enjoy life more. Um, here's Calvin and Hobbes. There's the big one and a little one. That's all I know. It looks like the big one's a tiger. Who's the little one? Little boy? Calvin, a little boy, thank you, uh, you theologians in the group. Uh, here the tiger comes along and looks at 
at uh, Calvin and says, do you have an idea for your story yet? Calvin's pr playing in the uh, sand pile, like a lot of men I know. No, I'm waiting for inspiration, he says. You just can't turn on creativity like a faucet. You have to be in the right mood. Then the big tiger says, well, what mood is that? And Calvin said, last minute panic. <laughs> I like that. Gentlemen, it's panic time in the kingdom of God, right? Listen, we had better turn back in radical commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. What's uh, my old motto? I shared the early service with this one. I'll share it again this one. Instant obedience, radical purity, everlasting endurance. Remember the great passage in uh, Philippians 4, and with this uh, uh, we'll close these little thoughts along with 1 Corinthians 13, 11. If you wonder where that is, just let me quote it. We haven't time to turn, but you take it and read it. It's one of my favorite passages. Paul says, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are right, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are admirable or attractive, think, he says, on these things. Those things which you have learned of me and seen in me and heard from me, do those things, and the God of peace will be with you. Isn't that a tremendous promise? Do those things. Now, take the passage the other way. Gentlemen, it simply means that we must not touch what is evil, any kind of sensuality or negative message on some of the vomit that's coming out over our television. We can't watch it. I have Christians even in this church who come up to me from time to time, and I'm not trying to pry. They say they've seen a certain movie, and I'm taking a little aback, and I read the uh, review of that movie, and I don't see how you can go. You can't see some of that filth and keep your mind untainted from the world. There must be a radical new appreciation of truth and holiness. Take that verse. Whatsoever things are dishonest, whatsoever things are a lie, whatsoever things are filthy, whatsoever things are ignoble, whatsoever things are dirty, whatsoever things are think on these things. We have to have men in this church who are going to take a new radical commitment, and I promise you, I'll try to be a man that takes that step with each one of you. I'm not preaching at the crowd. We must do it. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, there was a time when I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, I acted as a child. But when I came, became a man, I put away childish my beloved, I don't know what the world has ahead of us, but I know this, that if you and I in this church determine that we as women and, yes, as men, will commit ourselves to radical purity of the Lord Jesus Christ, will say, Father, keep me from being your enemy, then you will be blessed, your marriage will be blessed, your children will be blessed, and God will be honored. Only a fool would think that we can find what God meant when he made men can be found apart from radical commitment to him. What is the difference? What's, how can we mark the difference between a man that loves God and a man who doesn't? Between a man who's sold out to the world and a man who's sold out to God? They're pursuing the same thing. We want the same things. We're after money. We're after the bucks. We're after promotion. We're after the house. We're after the status. We're after whatever it takes. What is the difference? You and I need to spell that out. An American statesman was in Argentina a couple of years ago, and the Argentinian president asked him, what's the difference? Why has North America been so blessed and South America so in the area of poverty? And we can see that. Has that ever occurred to you? Why was it that the North American nation, the United States, became a powerful United Nation? And the South America, I mean... They're coming. They have good education. This is not racist or am I making an ethnic statement toward anyone down there. But we know if, there, if anyone's close to poverty and riches, we're the riches and they're the poverty ones. And our man answered. He said, it's quite simple. The Spaniards, when they came to South America years ago, came looking for gold. When the pilgrims came to America, they came looking for God. God has blessed us. We as Americans have turned our back 
on that great heritage. The word enemy, ekthra in the Greek, means to stand against. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. And if you're not helping Christ build his church, you're standing against him. You're helping to divide it. You cannot be neutral. Too many of us are neutral. I'm calling on you today. Not because we want to get a few more numbers in the church. That's poppycock. That's not true. That's not my heart. There are more people in this church now than, than I can take care of. It outgrew me years ago. But what we want to do, as long as God has brought about 2,000 of us together here, is to radicalize our commitment to doing those things that Christ wants. He wants to build us together. I shared in a Sunday school department this morning that the church basically is a group of people who come together and in honesty expose their weaknesses to one another and then solve them in the love of Christ. What happens so often, we come together, and when our weaknesses are exposed, we begin to point and to pick and to criticize and just create another fleshly organization. Are you helping Christ to build his church? Or are you helping to divide it? If you're neutral, you're helping to divide it. You're not helping. You're not carrying a part of the load. You're an enemy of the Lord. You and I both are to the degree that we do damage to this church that he's trying to build together. And I'm talking about all churches. There are churches bigger than ours. There are churches smaller than ours. And all we need to do is find the church the Father wants us to be in and then build it to the glory of Jesus Christ. That's what an enemy is, someone who's not building God's church. He's trying to put it together. Our tongues and our gossip is dividing it and our lack of commitment to it. The word cosmos, world, all that is alienated from the life of God, all that is contrary to God. It, pursuit of the world puts us in enmity with God. The perfect illustration is the alcoholic or the drug addict or the man who is uh, addicted to sensuality or pornography or a man who's a workaholic. He puts his job ahead of his wife and ahead of his children. He'll destroy them. Here's a man who says, oh, I love the bottle, I love the drink, I don't want to, but I love it so much I can't give it up. And here's a woman who says, but you're destroying yourself. You're not a leader to our children and to me. And here this man, what he loves so much over here automatically makes him an enemy of who he says he loves over here. And Satan has his greatest sting operation going. It cannot, will not work. And gentlemen, every one of us ought to vow today, Father, may it be so obvious to my wife, may it be so obvious to my children, may it be so obvious to my church that Jesus Christ is the primary passion of my life. I know we all have problems in sin and overbalance. I got over years ago, you know, watching a lot of athletics, and I tried just to watch the last few minutes. And here recently, the Bulls and the uh, Blazers had the great NBA playoff. They went six games, and I'm sure men were glued to every minute of it. And I wasted about ten minutes looking at all six of those games. Maybe I shouldn't say wasted because I enjoyed the minutes that I saw. I'm not into that, but I recently, when I was in Virginia, somewhere bought me a book on the Bataan Death March. Now, I'm really into military history. You all know that. And I could sin just as much. I could not, even though this is not wrong, it's not sin to watch the NBA playoff. It's not sin to read history. But it is sin if the playoffs or history is more exciting to you than Jesus Christ. And your quiet time will tell you what to do. Man, if you spend time every morning with the Lord, oh, Father, I really want to hear what your voice is to me today. I'm not going to become some kind of Pharisee, some kind of legalistic person that checks 10 minutes of TV here, five minutes of history there, four minutes of newspaper there. That's no good. A man or a woman that knows Jesus Christ can live in the power of the Spirit. But I ask you, gentlemen, how long has it been since your wife or your children have seen you as excited about Jesus Christ as you are about your job or you are about athletics or you are about your golf game or your fishing trip or your new office or your new car or what have you? Now, there's a good question. Do you display excitement about God, gentlemen? It's a good question, isn't it? None of those things I mentioned are wrong. Very few things in life are wrong, except those things spelled out in the Word of God that are immoral. But what we need to show, gentlemen, is a radical delight and excitement, a genuine thrill about the things of Jesus Christ. And on this day and time, if you're not showing that, in fact, if you genuinely have more excitement, you have to clear the house out, get the kids away, wife, make the popcorn, leave me alone, I've got to watch this game. If that's the most exciting thing in your life, you're going to send a message to your family that will destroy them. Same thing about Sunday evening church. As long as I'm in trouble, I might as well go ahead with it. 
Uh, I don't really think that uh, my motive is trying to get you down here to massage my ego and hear me preach on Sunday night. My mother and dad never went to church with me, never. When I became a believer, I was there Sunday morning and Sunday night. Man, I just couldn't get enough of it. I'm almost 60 years of age. I've known the Lord Jesus about 42 years. And my testimony to you is this. Other than the, some of the personal times I've had with the Lord Jesus Christ, Sunday nights in God's house hearing His Word with a group of committed people has been the second greatest blessing of my life. And some of you vote it down week after week after week. This doesn't mean you have to be here every Sunday night. Wednesday night, you know, I've prayed every Wednesday night for 28 years, or 27 years, I've been your pastor, and some of you hadn't showed up one Wednesday night in 27 years to pray with me for revival in this church. Now, something's wrong there, don't you think? That doesn't mean every Wednesday night. I'm not putting anyone under the law. No one, when we stand before Jesus Christ, I hope, is going to be able to say, when H.D. McCarty was pastor of University Baptist Church, he tried to put me under the law. He tried to make me feel bad. He tried to work on my guilt. He tried to get me just to come to meetings. That's a lie. Never, 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 never. I only want you to develop a personal thrusting life with the Lord Jesus Christ and hunger for Him. And out of your quiet time and your reading of the Scripture and your reading of the hymns and in your prayer and your talking to God and in Him talking to you, let Him tell you what to do. That's the only thing that will protect you from being an enemy of the Lord. One who is in opposition. One who will fall for Satan's sting operation.